Hey, it's Linda and it's great to be hanging out with you today. People can sometimes go through tough times due to health problems and they can even experience fear in that. But we know that having Jesus in our lives, we don't have to be afraid. But sometimes a little bit of extra help can help us manage our circumstances even better. We visited Dog Guides Canada and got a glimpse into how dog guides can change people's lives and help give them peace of mind when they're challenged with specific health problems. So the qualities that we look for in our dogs, we want dogs that are caring, that love to work for people, that are natural learners. So for a dog who's very sniffy, a little bit higher in energy, we'd be perfect for a diabetic alert program. Uh, versus a dog, let's say, that's super bomb proof, that's really confident, we'd be perfect for the canine vision program. So we really try to play up on the dog's natural abilities. So a lot of the times when someone loses their vision, they do tend to lose confidence in themselves. So the dogs bring that element of safety to, to the client, that element of, of independence. I'm Sandra, I'm 44 years old. I was part of the canine vision program and I got my canine vision dog, Kylie. She is my trained guide dog where she helps me when I'm outside. She's my trusted companion, and she's like my daughter, the daughter that I've never had. Okay, let's go find the elevator buttons. I had a lot of panic attacks going out into the street, going to the mall. I would just, I would avoid it at all costs because I was just so scared to do it. Oh. I would cross into a path and get hit by a grocery cart because I didn't see it coming. And I would be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And the person would be like, what are you, blind or something? And, yeah. It's the dog's responsibility to get them there safely and effectively by navigating obstacles, stopping at curbs to indicate to the client that they've reached an intersection, uh, et cetera, et cetera. When we get closer to the traffic, and I can hear it, I'll ask her to find the down curve, and that's where a guide dog will stop. Some streets in the city of Toronto have an audible button. With the audible buttons, for north-south is one signal, and for east-west is a different, so you actually know what direction you're going into. I have to learn the traffic, so I can hear the east-west cars are stopped, and that the north-south cars are going, and I know we can cross the street safely. She's my eyes, so she directs me where I need to go. I feel much, much safer being with her, being out on the road with her, being out anywhere with her. The dogs are an added tool that the person already uses to manage, um, let's say, their diabetes or, or any medical condition that they may have. With a diabetic service dog, it's a little bit different because a diabetic service dog is trained to learn the scent of when their client goes into a low sugar. So once they go into that low sugar, the dog is trained to go get the insulin candy kit and bring it to their client. This way the client can either take their insulin, take that little bit of candy or whatnot, the kit will always remain in the same area for the dog, and it's always in a low area that the dog can get to. If the dog notices that the diabetic client is not coming out of that diabetic low, there's a special phone that the dog can dial the emergency contact for the diabetic person for emergency personnel to arrive. With me, my fear was I didn't even want to leave the condo at one point. I was just too scared to leave here. My fears of being blind and not being able to do things are almost not there anymore. I can do things and I can do them with her help. I have less panic and anxiety attacks right now when I'm with her. Her and I have created a bond and it's basically like unconditional love between the both of us. The people and dogs at Dog Guides Canada do phenomenal work and we have so much respect and appreciation for them. If you're a dog lover and feel like you can help in any way, reach out to them and show your love and concern for others by taking the dogs for a walk or helping out with any other needs they may have.
Hello, welcome to the Meeting House live stream. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at the Meeting House and your live stream host. Boy, is it good to be together today. Hey, if you are just joining us like right now, then you just missed an incredible video. I'm talking about Guide Dogs Canada. Um, right before our time together, we show these little uh, Kid Max videos, these life stories or God stories. And today's was about um, guide dogs and guide dogs Canada and the impact that they have in their communities and the impact that these dogs have. It was so amazing. Please, I encourage you, go check it out. It was so fun. Such amazing dogs. And if only my pandemic puppy acted even close to that, I think my life would be a little bit less stressful, that would be fun. Anyways, it is so good to be together today, as I mentioned. Hey, if you are um, a part of the Meeting House and typically go to one of our in-person parishes, I just wanna encourage you, you can go to themeetinghouse.com slash locations to get updated on um, what your parish is doing, what their rhythms of meeting during these uh, lockdowns and not lockdowns and back and forth is, or you can check out your uh, local parish's social media pages. Feel free to check that out. I just wanted to highlight that for you in case that is a place that you normally go to and you're not sure where to get those updates. So please do feel free to check that out. So speaking about our local parishes. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about local compassion stories from our parishes. And I've been blown away at the incredible things, the incredible uh, ways that you, our parishes, our communities, this church has been impacting our local uh, communities and organizations that we partner with. Well, I had the opportunity uh, this week to chat with one of those organizations. They actually received some funding from our Compassion Ministry, and it was just such an encouraging conversation. I want to uh, send us all over there. Let's, uh, let's listen to that conversation now. Hello, everyone. I am here with Doreen, Program Director from Matthew House, Ottawa. Doreen, it is so good to be together. Thank you for joining us uh, for this time. Uh, so, Doreen, tell Thank us a little bit about who Matthew House Ottawa is. Thank you for having me. Matthew House Ottawa is a local charity based in Ottawa. We have two programs, the Fancha Bank and the Refugee Services, uh, we are, which I serve. And we, at the Refugee Services program, we welcome newly arrived refugees, refugee claimants. They are a special category of refugees, and we provide provide them with a place to call home and uh, all the social support that they need to start their life in Canada. Uh, most of our refugees are from Sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, pro uh, they have really come from all over the world. Uh, we are able to serve 24 refugees at a time, and uh, over the year we can actually serve up to 75. Wow, that's so fantastic. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit, why is this work important then? So uh, refugee claimants arrive in Canada without any other source of support, and we just hand uh, hold their hand and uh, provide them with the support they need to navigate the refugee claim process and to start their life in Canada. So without us, they are going to end up in uh, the emergency shelter system which is actually not set up to support ref newcomers. So uh, we take them from the emergency shelter system, we give them a place to call home, a uh, family to, 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 to belong to, and then we support them with all their needs to, to start their life, including finding jobs, finding their next home. And uh, this is important because without us, uh, recently we had a family who had a baby with us, uh, I, you can imagine what would have happened if they, were not, if they were in the emergency shelter and they wouldn't get the support they need to have a baby to, 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 to integrate at the same time. Wow, so not only individuals but families too. I think that's so, that's so beautiful. So recently the Meeting House gave Matthew House Ottawa a grant. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this project and maybe a little bit about the impact that this uh, project has had? Yes, thank you. For the longest time, uh, since 2010, 2010, when Matthew House started, uh, in, we got this grant in 2020 and we were able to expand, actually triple our program from eight to wow. 24 refugees at a time. So 
uh, because we were able to hire a staff person to support the program during the pandemic, when we had uh, very limited uh, access to volunteers who naturally support our work. So the, the, the support from the meeting house was a big help to get us start this house and keep it running for six months during the pandemic. That was very, very helpful. Thank you so much to the meeting house. Wow, that's so great, Doreen, and so encouraging. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And thank you for having me. I had such a great time uh, chatting with Doreen and hearing a little bit about the work that Matthew House Ottawa is doing. That is really an incredible organization. And so Doreen, Alan, the rest of your team, we are cheering you on and praying for you. Uh, so thankful for the work that you are doing uh, up in Ottawa with the many people uh, that you are impacting. Stories like this are really just brief glimpses of the incredible work that uh, God is doing in and through the Meeting House. And really, these are possible through uh, your generous giving, through the gifts that you give, through the compassion ministry here at the Meeting House. And if you want to be a part of that, if you want to uh, join that in what God is doing through the Meeting House in that way, feel free to go to themeetinghouse.com slash give for more information and you can... Um, yeah, get more information or sign up to give there at that location. Okay, we are going to head to Jesus Walks Part 2 with Jimmy. I'm really excited to be continuing this uh, series together. But before we head there, let's pray together. Jesus, we just come to you today as we are. You are present in our lives wherever it is that we, we are. We acknowledge that. We know that you are uh, the most real thing in our lives right now. I just pray that we could be more sensitive uh, to your spirit at work in our lives. Lord, I lift uh, the rest of this service up to you. I ask that your spirit would be speaking to us in ways that we can hear you, in ways that we can understand you, that you would be drawing us closer to you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. It is such a privilege for us here to be able to do the music, and we really hope to create a moment where you can feel God, his presence, feel him moving, he's at work. We're going to take a few minutes and, and sing some songs together.
see freedom when i see that grave i'll see jesus and from death to life i will sing your praise in the wonder of your grace when i see that cross i see freedom when i see that grave i'll see jesus and from death to life i will sing your Hebrews 13, 5 to 6 says, God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And sometimes the way we experience God's love is through people. Experience his provision through people, through family and friends and community. Sometimes he gives us someone to walk through the fire with us to walk through the storm with us. We're meant to enter into each other's suffering, to be God's hands and feet, to be with those that we love, to be together. Sometimes that looks like sharing a meal, going for a walk, going for coffee, talking about our joys and our sorrows and letting people in, sharing and listening. That is God's love. That is a way we can experience his presence. We're not meant to do this life alone. We're not meant to suffer alone, not even for a second. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire. Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore and should I fall in the space between where it pains of me and this reckoning either 
Between all the things unseen in this reckoning, I know I will never be jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane and I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so jealous for me love like a hurricane and I am a tree bending beneath the weight of your wind and mercy and all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions these eclipsed by glory and I realize just you are and how great your reflections are for me.
so much for your love. Thank you for how you provide through the people in our lives. God, allow us to allow others to use the gifts you've given them. Allow us to accept help. Allow us to allow people in our suffering and our hard times. And help us be with others, even if it's just sitting with them. God, your love is so big and to experience it is so amazing and powerful, and we don't want to miss out on that. So God, show us your love through one another, through our friends, through our family, through our community. Help us to be aware of your presence, aware of how you're moving, aware of how you're stirring in us. And we thank you so much for your love, God. Amen. Luke 24 is often seen as a model of the journey that Jesus makes with many of us today, as he opens our eyes, points us to the word, and reveals himself along life's walk as the resurrected Savior and Lord. S.M. Hootman. Unless we read scripture through the lens of the crucified Christ with others, our exegesis is dangerously subject to personal preferences and political allegiances. Rich Velotis. God, show me the way because the devil's trying to break me down. Jesus walks with me. The only thing that I pray is that my feet don't fail me now. Jesus walks, Kanye. The road to Emmaus is just the beginning. Hearing Jesus' voice in scripture, knowing him in the breaking of bread is the way. Welcome to God's new world. N.T. Wright. 
Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us? Cleopas, Luke 24, 32. Come, follow me, Jesus. Friends, good morning. Welcome to part two of our series, Jesus Walks, where we're talking about the everyday movements of Jesus' life and teaching, how he oriented his daily habits, his rhythms, his pace, and also uh, his, his leadership, his servanthood, how he interacted with the surroundings, and definitely how he oriented and directed uh, his teaching. And there's so much for us to learn as we journey with alongside Jesus. So like I said, we're in part two. And last week we started with Brother Quincy, which was so good. Uh, come and see. And then today we're talking about close and with and staring into the story, the, the record of the road to Emmaus or Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. And that is a banger, a banger of a section of scripture. Well, we'll get, we'll get to that in just a few minutes. I also want to say happy new year ish. Like, it's 2022, depending on when you're listening to this. And uh, yeah, it's been a weird start, don't you think? I mean, for many of us, you know, New Year's brings new hope, new resolves, new rhythms, new things we want to try, things we want to maybe like let fall by the wayside. And uh, this year has just sort of has started with fraught and, 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 and struggle. And that's exactly what we're talking about today. Like how Jesus, how does Jesus walk with us in struggle and in stress? And I mean, uh, aren't those two words, struggle and stress, just the marker of 2022 for so many of us. I mean, think about how we've started the, the beginning of the year marked another, you know, pseudo lockdown here in Canada, going back to, to online uh, for the majority of us whether that's school or church or even, you know, work rhythms, our family rhythms have shifted alongside of that. It's super cold here. We lost Betty White. We lost Sidney Poitier. Like 2022 coming in super hot or cold, uh, don't you think? And it's really cold here in Canada. You know, if you're watching from around the world, you're like, well, isn't it always cold in Canada? Well, yeah, but this is like, this is a different thing. This is like central Canada cold. And so for many of us, when we think about this new year and the months to come, we're like, you know, clenching our fists and our jaws being like, hold on tight. Who knows what's to come? But for some of us, and I hope by the end of walking through this passage for most of us, uh, we're looking towards hope. What's the, what's the prefer, preferred future? What, what, what is Jesus teaching us, modeling for us, and inspiring in us, illuminating in us, that moves us away from despair uh, and disenfranchisement and dysfunction and moves us to the, to the closeness of the hope, the joy of God, the presence of the Spirit here with, in, and through us? Now, for me, I'll admit, I, I love New Year's. I love the resolve of like making new commitments, uh, you know, examining uh, my life, my health and well-being and, you know, making changes based on that. Now, typically I've been um, a workout guy. I, uh, I love fitness. I love weightlifting. Um, I, that's like my, my sanctuary, my space where I can just kind of like shut out the outside world, go in and weights will never lie to you. One of my fitness mentors uh, has said that repeatedly, but... What I noticed this year is a lot of that shifted. Uh, being alone, uh, being in like, you know, confined space is like my everyday reality. You know, I'm talking to screens. I'm very infrequently in person with people and all of my rhythms are like very short and explosive and sometimes stressful. You know, meeting after meeting and like trying to screen through meal times and trying to fit my fitness in and make sure I get the right amount of sleep. And I just found myself, especially at the beginning of January, here, and especially knowing uh, that we are planning for this series, what are the rhythms of Jesus? What are the rhythms of work and ministry and life that Jesus uh, embodies? Um, like, what am I doing? What am I doing with my time and space? And so it may surprise you to know that one of the things that came screaming into reality, something that I needed to make a priority with all of the stresses that are, uh, you know, in and around uh, for many of us, but for, for our family, for sure, is just the notion of slowing down, slowing 
down, not speeding up, not making a, you know, a, a longer, lengthier checklist of you know, goals and strategies, but just slowing down. And so one of the things that my wife and I have committed to doing multiple times uh, you know, um, during the week is, is walking. It's just getting outside before the sun rises early in the morning and just walking together. Now, for me, that might seem like, well, of course, that's so good for you. There's tons of research, and there is. Uh, but for me, in my, uh, you know, life, that's never been something that I've done is just to prioritize the slowness of walking. And so maybe for you, you know, that's been a rhythm or maybe that's a new rhythm. In fact, like while you're listening right now, just comment in the chat right here of like what, what has worked for you so far. Or even if it's walking, like what are some strategies, what are some like rhythms of walking that have been helpful for you? What's been helpful to notice for me as like that first week uh, eked on, the first few times that we went for a walk, uh, and it's like, it's dark, it's cold, you know, we're kind of bleary eyed and still like wiping the sleep crust off of our eyes, my wife and I. And the first thing we notice is there are others. We are not alone. We, we're not by ourselves in this. And so it's fascinating. We live right in downtown Hamilton, like right in the central core downtown. And so you kind of have to weave in and out of the, you know, the concrete jun jungle, the, the neighborhood that we're in. And then we have a path kind of like close to our house. And so we hit the trail. Uh, and as we start walking, we've noticed that we see regular people. We see that there are others, but they're the same others, uh, you know, day after day and week after week so far. And it's just been, it's like, again, as an extrovert, it's brought me such semblance of inclusion, community, and connection. Even if we're just doing like a polite hello to each other on the way by, it's like, okay, this is good. We're not alone. We're going to throw up some slides right now just to show the benefit of, of like what does walking do to our physiology, our overall holistic health. Uh, and there are so many things. Uh, first of all, I mean, this is the genius of Jesus, that Jesus orients his, his travels, his ministry life, not towards quick commutes, but slow walking and inviting his followers to do the same. Uh, and it's fascinating in terms of like what that does for our mental, emotional, spiritual health is that um, as our oxygen levels go out, uh, go up when we go outside, so does our stress levels go down and our brain function goes up. Outdoor air improves brain function, especially if a person, if we're cooped up in an office or on a screen all day long. Number two, increase in vitamin D. Uh, when we're out in sunlight, a, per a person's skin uh, synthesizes vitamin D and vitamin D, D like protects our brain, protects the neurons in the brain and it reduces inflammation. Our bodies get less swollen with anxiety and stress and more centered and focused and healthy. And then number three, just that, stress reduction. Our cortisol levels, our stress uh, hormones go down uh, and our energy levels um, and endorphins go up. You know, walking reduces our stress, helps to remind us of who we really are. It regulates our mood. It keeps us centered, uh, not tipping one way or the other. I don't think this is just like a coincidence with the ministry and life of Jesus. I think the fact that Jesus came as a walking Messiah is a fascinating, fast. I mean, this could be a sermon all on its own. Notice that Jesus, this is like the incarnate God, the, the creator of the cosmos uh, coming to earth in a lowly fashion, walking around. We, we rarely, if ever, in the New Testament, in the record of Jesus' life and ministry, see Jesus like uh, doing anything else but walking. Now, again, this might seem like, well, yeah, of course, that's just, it was an agrarian culture. That's how things happened. It, it isn't, it isn't brothers and sisters. If you were a king or a priest or a temple leader or a Pharaoh or a Caesar, you never walked, you never walked. You, you had horses and chariots and, uh, you know, donkeys and camels uh, if you needed to travel anywhere. And you didn't go to people, people came to you. So it's fascinating that even in, in the notion of Jesus' travels, of his insistence, intention on walking, of slowing down, we see the notion of humility, of slowness, of connectedness, that this is Jesus God made flesh among us, not away from us, not saying people, you know, you, you need to come to me, but instead uh, Jesus saying, I'm going to go where people are. Walking was a statement of priorities. Kings and Messiahs didn't go to walk with people. People came to them. Jesus flips the script here. 
again. Jesus shows how to be intentionally slow and present and close with us and reminds us to prioritize slow time together. And this is, brings us to our central text, Luke 24, which, Mike, like, this could be a whole ser- this could be a whole summer of sermons uh, just on this text alone. But for the sake of time, we're just going to hone in on three three principles. So I invite you to um, uh, grab your Bible, and there are uh, notes. Um, we'll drop those in the chat as well. We're having some difficulties with slides this morning, so you won't see the the, the scripture uh, on on the screen here. But feel free to grab your Bible. And if you're just checking us out for the first time, if you're like I I don't I don't handle a Bible, I don't know what that means. Um, if you have a Bible close by or or just like Google Bible Gateway, pick up, uh, it, you know, your phone. You can look it up there and then go to the book of Luke. It's right in the center of the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And then um, fast forward to chapter 24. While you're doing that, we're going to be starting in, in verse 13. While you're doing that, I'll mention that through this series, just with uh, being online uh, and nothing right now for the most part in person, we won't be doing live Q&A, but... The after party has been resurrected. It is risen. Uh, so feel free to send in your questions to ask at the meetinghouse.com. Ask at the meetinghouse.com. And Quincy will be leading us at the end of this month with our, uh, our after party conversation with uh, him, Danielle, and myself. So ask at the meetinghouse.com. All right, let's jump in. And like I said, buckle up, my friends. This is such a fascinating, whew, fascinating passage. All right, Luke 24, starting in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, or Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked among them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleophas asked him, are you the only visitor stranger to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these last few days? What things? Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and other rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one, that he was going to redeem Jerusalem. And what's more, it's the third day since all of this took place. And then in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen some vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. And then some of our companions actually went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And Jesus said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses, the law and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, concerning himself. And then as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, no, 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 stay with us for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Oh, my goodness. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Then they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon, just like he said. And then the two told what what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. I told you, my goodness. All right, a couple things to note about the context within the context of this passage. Now, Jesus has been crucified. He's been tried, crucified, is killed on a cross. His body has been taken down and he's been buried in uh, in a, you know, a tomb. Um, So it's over. Now, again, Cleophas, this is likely uh, Cleophas and and his wife. Um, uh, Some scholars would suggest that this might be like the uncle uh, of Jesus. So it's Joseph's um, brother and uh, uh, wife, uh, Joseph's brother and sister-in-law. And now these aren't 
um, two people that are part of the 12. It's like the outer circle, well, inner circle, but like the outer ring of Jesus' um, uh, leaders uh, and disciples. And they have lost everything. So remember, they, they uh, intended, hoped, planned that Jesus would be the Messiah. Resurrection and like going from death to life was never part of the plan. It was never part of their, their um, you know, religious history. It was never part of their writings that they knew of at the time. Uh, so this was like turning things on its head. So they're scattered. The, everything is, is done. They've left Jerusalem. So the place where God resides, where God lives in his temple, in his holy place, the holy city of Israel, they're like, nope. And we're probably going to be killed. I mean, we've been following this like this rabbi who taught something way different than we're used to. Uh, we're probably going to have to follow suit. If we don't get out of here, things are going to go really, really poorly for us. And so they flee the city. Uh, they're taking off and they're headed on the road to Emmaus, this village. We don't actually know where Emmaus is, but it's like seven to 10 miles away from Jerusalem. Now in and around Jerusalem, again, it's not like today where there's like the 403, 401 and walking trails everywhere, like where we walk in the morning. These were desert roads, uninhabited, very dark. Uh, and so to, to flee at this time, especially as we read on, the day is getting later and later, was a dangerous thing. But they're taking on the risk and just being like, we've got to get out of here. We've got to get out of here. They're walking on a desert, desert road alone, dismayed, uh, discouraged on the third day of everything changing for the worst, they think. And then this stranger comes along, this, this figure comes along and says, you know, they're talking on the way. And Jesus is like, what are, what are you talking about? And they say, well, like, have you not heard? Like, you know, what, what stranger or visitor has not heard about the things? Like, this has been a bit of a, a riot, an eruption in the city of Jerusalem. Like, we thought something was going to, ha to happen. We thought this Jesus of Nazareth was, like, the real deal. Um, but now we maybe think he was a prophet or a messenger or something like that, but we just, we just don't know. And then we heard this tale of like uh, some, some women in our group went to the tomb and saw that his body wasn't there. So we're trying to make sense of that as well. We just don't know what's up. And Jesus like rebukes them. It's fascinating that Jesus corrects their cynicism and doubt right there. We don't see, you know, huggy Jesus being like, oh, it's okay, everything's going to be okay. He rebukes them. He stops them in their tracks. Now, it's fascinating. Um, the text also suggests that, like, they don't recognize him. Now, for us, we'd be like, oh, this is crazy. Like, this is why we can't trust the Bible. Why wouldn't they recognize him? Well, again, they, they, this is, they name him as a stranger, like as a, a, a foreigner, a sojourner, an alien. An alien. And, and the Greek words are kind of interchangeable here. This is somebody who is not from their culture, they're assuming, and definitely not from the city, they're assuming. So there are tons of risks being outside the city, outside of civilization and traveling into the desert. And so they probably weren't making a lot of eye contact. Um, and then Jesus goes further, asks what they're talking about and uh, rebukes them and then explains the whole Bible to them. Ah. Oh. So fascinating is Jesus says, start, uh, Luke records that starting with the, the law, the law of Moses, like the, the, the mode for living in, in Jewish custom and teaching, and then the prophets, what will happen in the future? Jesus teaches all about it and says that it all points to himself. It all points back to Jesus. First, uh, like, think about what this would have felt like. You, you've thought everything is lost, and then the stranger, who you're not really paying attention to, but you kind of want to, you know, keep some semblance of dignity. You know, in, in Israelite cu custom, you had the responsibility as a follower of God to take care of the stranger, to take care of the for foreigner, to take care of the alien, to take care of the journeyer, the wanderer, the sojourner. And Jesus identifies just as that, as a traveler, a stranger. That's how Luke frames him, how Cleophas uh, identifies him, could have been a spy for Rome. Uh, so, so these people are holding their cards very close to the chest. And then Jesus explains the whole Bible to them, and Jesus embodies and fulfills the whole thing. All on the road, somewhere else. Running away from problems, stress, suffering. Um, Jesus meets them there. Amazing, amazing. Jesus walks alongside them. And then fascinating what happens next. He sits down with them over a meal. So they get to um, the house. They get to where they're going. 
and we don't know if that's their home or if it's, uh, you know, some in-between place that they've made arrangements to stay at. And then Jesus mentions that he intends to go on further. So this is almost like Jesus testing is like, did this really get into your bones? Like, you, you know that you're meant to care for people who are wandering, who are doubting, who are foreign, who are alien, who are Gentiles. This has always been who you are. Are you going to do it here? And they do. They do. They, they take up the cause. They invite Jesus in. Still, their, their eyes are hidden from uh, who he is. Uh, and then they offer him a meal. Now, this was a, a very normative tradition in Eastern hospitality. You would always take care uh, of, you know, somebody who was a stranger or who was not part of your family. You would invite them in and offer them uh, a meal. This was like the, this was an extension of God's heart through you is, is an extension of the tradition to care and care and care to not let anybody go hungry or thirsty or without a place to sleep. That's fascinating. These people are offering the meal. And what does Jesus do? He takes the meal and offers it back to them. He takes the meal and offers it back to them. Uh, Luke records that he takes the bread and he breaks it. And after he had broken it, he gave thanks or gives a blessing and passes it back to them. And then their eyes are open. They're like, oh my goodness, now we're face to face. Like we're across from each other, probably reclining on a chair, like this big comfy one. Uh, and you, you can imagine they sit straight up and they're like, this is Jesus. Oh my goodness. And then poof, he's gone. <laughs> oh, the mystery of God and the mystery of the Bible. He just, poof, he just evaporates. He's gone. And it's fascinating. I mean, think about the doubt that these two, this couple likely have uh, shown through the text. They, they, don't believe, they leave the city, they're wandering along, they really don't pay attention to the stranger, they offer him a place to eat, and then he poof, immaterializes in front of them. I think for me, I would be like, what did I just hallucinate? And we don't see that in the text. We see that they lean in and say, it was him, it was him, it's all true. It's all true. And then they, they, uh, Cleophas makes this beautiful statement. We're not our hearts burning within us as we walked along and he told us the story. They spent slow time with Jesus and with scripture. It's been explained to them. Jesus brings it to light and clarity that all scripture converges on and points towards Jesus. And then they share a meal together. And isn't, it isn't until that closeness, until that connection, that everything begins to come into focus, that everything begins to make sense, that everything starts to ring true. As N.T. Wright puts it, welcome to the new way, friends. Welcome to the new way, uh, Cleophas. God's new world alive and well among us over a conversation, a walk, and a meal, breaking bread together. So it's fascinating. When you're walking, talk to each other. When you're done walking, eat together. When you're eating together, talk to each other. When you're done talking to each other, care for each other, provide resources and community and compassion uh, with and for each other. Everything seems lost. This is the beginning of a devastating season for these disciples and these uh, two people who, who had walked with Jesus for so, so long. All seems lost. Jesus meets them outside of the place where they thought that God was in the desert. He walks alongside them. He asks and he probes. He corrects. He uses scripture to point back to himself. He shares a meal with them. He reveals himself and then he disappears saying, like, continue the story share the story, go back. And they hustle back to Jerusalem and they meet with the 12 and the other disciples who uh, are still there. And they say, it's all true. It's, the story has changed from what we thought would happen, but it's all true. Jesus is alive, is resurrected. And what does Jesus care about? S slowness, intentionality, community, meal sharing, fellowship, caring for the alien, the foreigner, being with each other in stress and struggle, not apart from each other, being communally bound, not individually uh, isolated. It's fascinating stuff. It's fascinating stuff, especially now, especially now for us. Now, if you were to ask yourself today, or even just looking past uh, on this past like few weeks, or even just like this past week, would you say, would I say, that my schedule is intentional? That the way I orient my life is non-distracted and fully present? Would the, the markers of my like daily habits be fully invested in people, in my family, in the people that live in my home, or my friendship groups, or my faith community at church? Or 
would they be uh, a little bit more detached from that? If we were to look back and be honest with ourselves over the last few weeks, would we say, I don't think things have gotten better. I think I've found myself more isolated, more insulated, more trying to get quickly through things and then, you know, going after cheap uh, rewards and cheap fixes, you know, whether that be food or drink or like unhealthy relationship or unhealthy patterns and rhythms. Like, where do we find ourselves in, these, in this story? You know, if you picture yourself walking on that desert road, um, do you find yourself walking quick? Let's just get away from this. Let's just get away from this. When Jesus enters onto the scene and talks to you specifically in this story, do you find yourself dismissive, doubtful, anxious, cynical? When you sit down for a meal, do you find yourself kind of rolling your eyes? You know, maybe like you're one of those two and you're like, let's just get this meal over with so that we can just go to bed. And maybe that's the marker of your family gatherings right now. Just like, let's just get this meal over with. Uh, so that we don't really have to talk, don't have to face our own struggles, don't have to like communicate our doubts or our joys and hopes and victories. We can just eat, watch Netflix, and go to bed. What do we sense Jesus saying to us right here, right now, through this story? Where is Jesus rebuking us, correcting us? Where is Jesus illuminating scripture in and through and for us? And like I said, when we started, there's great research to show the benefits of like walking outside, connecting regularly with trusted community and meal sharing. Uh, you know, being together and fully present with people is intricately like uh, connected to human thriving. It's how we do well. But there's also no shortage of research right now to show that we're struggling. Um, that life is not easy. And for many of us, our rhythms have not improved. They've devolved. Our friendships, our families, and our cities, our communities are struggling, and for good reason. They're distracted and doubtful and dis disjointed, and for good reason. But friends, I think this is where we can really embody and follow the lead and character of Jesus uh, and exemplify Jesus to a world that desperately needs it by showing that we can be, that in the same way that Jesus is close and with us, we can be close and with each other, that we can reach out, walk with, talk with, and meal share with each other. In the same way that Jesus models closeness and withness to and with us, we can model and embody the same with each other, that we should embody the same uh, with each other and with others. So three questions as we move towards our wrap up here. Number one, who are you walking with right now? Who is your regular travel slow conversation, regular rhythms of relational connectedness with Jesus, hopefully, and dot, dot, dot. Is there some time maybe that you could set aside this week to get outside, to go for a prayer walk, to just like shut out the outside distractions, to walk with Jesus and say like, what are you saying to me? And then as you do that, like who could you invite along with? Who could you talk with? Talk to Jesus and then who else? If it's somebody else like along the road with you, even better. So who are you walking with? Number two, who are you talking with? Jesus and is there a conversation that, uh, you know, you may be avoiding or a person that you may have been uh, disconnected with for so long that you're like, oh, it's just so weird and awkward to try and reconnect. I'm just going to ignore it or just like put it out of my mind. Is there a conversation that you could book like this week, like today? Maybe it's somebody in the chat right now that you're saying, you're like, oh yeah, you know, John or Kate or, you know, Amy or whoever. I used to hang out with them and like we haven't really chatted in a while. Maybe the spirit of God right now is being like, you should text them. Like even right now, just say hi and, and make plans to connect. Maybe it's a phone chat, maybe it's a text, maybe you could initiate and say, because of what I've learned and experienced um, in and through and with Jesus, uh, I'm reaching out and saying, hey, I see you. I'm sorry it's been so long. I miss you. Can we chat? Can we connect? So who, who are you walking with? Jesus and? Who are you talking with? Jesus and? And then who are you eating with? Jesus and? Same thing. Is there somebody that you could... Um, share a meal with this week or take a meal to somebody in your community that's, uh, you know, suffering, that you know is alone, that lives alone. I think this is one of the most important parts of our ministry. The embodiment of Jesus is the body of Christ is like reaching out with food. 
I had like three conversations this week uh, with people who are like, I don't have anything to eat or I don't have anything, anybody to eat with, you know, could, could we hang out? Could we chat about? Could you help? Could you resource? I hope that our answer is always, always yes. I hope that we have bandwidth and time in our schedules to really embody Jesus, to say, no, 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 this is the priority. Work can wait. Working out can wait. Being relationally connected to somebody who is desperately needing it and devastatingly unknown should always be the priority. And that's deeply convicting for, for, for me as well as somebody who, who likes checking off boxes. Where do we need to slow down, recline on a chair, and share or offer a meal to each other with. And that could be like a coffee or a walk or a brunch or lunch, whatever it is. Who do we need to slow down, recline on a chair, and share a meal and a conversation with? So uh, who, who are you walking with? Who are you talking with? And who are you sharing a meal with? I don't want to rush through this moment. Um, I'm hopeful that the Spirit of God is illuminating and putting, you know, his thumbprint on our hearts and saying, listen, 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 I'm speaking to you right now. So I want to give us just a few seconds to just pause and listen to what God might be saying about how we can, how he's nudging us to be more close and with each other, and then we'll wrap up. So take 10, 15 seconds to just close your eyes, maybe stop the chat and just ask God, where are you nudging me? Where and how and who with should I be walking and talking and meal sharing? Let's just take a minute right now. Well, friends, as we wrap up our time here. I hope it doesn't wrap up, actually. I hope our time together continues more than just a sermon or a church experience together. I hope that we can continue to embody being the body of Christ together, that we can continue to grow and flourish and embody Jesus in the way that we walk and talk and eat together. And my prayer, friends, is that this week we find ourselves walking in the goodness and the grace and the closeness of the presence of God wherever we find ourselves despite the circumstances. Brothers and sisters, today may you find yourself uh, and this week in deep conversations at dinner times and coffee times and brunch times and text times and phone times and Zoom times that remind us how close and deep the love of Jesus is. And may we find that as we slow down and listen to each other, that our hearts would be overwhelmed with a sense of the burning love of Jesus, burning with connection as we journey with Jesus together. And so brothers and sisters, may the grace of God, the love of Jesus and the presence of the spirit be close and with us this week and in the weeks to come as we walk together. And together we say, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. Boy, what good questions to ponder. Who are we walking with? Who are we talking with? Who are we eating with? Sharing life with, right? Are we going from distraction to, to distraction, hurrying in between, or are we living a life of intentionality uh, with and for others? Yeah, Jimmy, thank you so much. And if if this is uh, striking a chord with you and you are wrestling with this and want a place to connect with others, we've got something called home churches, right? Opportunities to come together, to kind of face each other, do life together. You can go to themeetinghouse.com slash home church to check out more information about that. We've got many that meet online, some that are situated in locations and some that are more globally focused. So you can find the right one uh, for you. Another reminder that there is going to be an after party um, at the end of this series, so feel free to send your questions to ask at themeetinghouse.com. It has been such a good time together, and as Jimmy said, this doesn't end here. Make sure you are finding the people and the places to continue this conversation, to continue this journey with. It's been so good to be together. Godspeed, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.